Welcome to um, Lifespan Development uh, or Developmental Psychology. Uh, today, uh, we're going over the last chapter, which is actually the epilogue, if you're using the book that I recommend, and it's about death and dying. Okay, so let's get started. I don't have an overview for you, for you guys, an outline of the things we're going to cover, because I wanted to cut down on the number of slides to make sure we can get through this uh, in, the, in the time we have. Um, so we're just going to go through it. Okay, so let's talk first about how death has changed in the past 100 years. So death today is not the same as it used to be 100 years ago. Okay, uh, death occurs later. People live longer nowadays. Okay, I think the average is about 78. And the average, by the way, varies between men and women. Uh, for women, the average is about 80. For men, it's about 75. So somewhere in the middle gets you 77, 78. Um, men don't last as long as women. And because men usually marry women who are a little bit younger than themselves, uh, they actually die several years, you know, before uh, their spouse does if they're still together when they're older. Okay. Dying now takes longer. People don't uh, die right away now. Uh, they may linger for a while while they're sick uh, or uh, frail. Uh, in the past, um, be, uh, there was healthcare wasn't as good. Uh, people didn't last as long. Medication wasn't as good. Um, and of course, people often die suddenly from car accidents and, you know, things like that, right? Um, but dying takes longer now, more likely because we have better medicine nowadays, better health care. So people can remain sick for a while, okay? Uh, death often occurs in hospitals nowadays. Most people die in hospitals. In the past, that was not the case. Usually people died in their homes. And by the way, some people still die in their homes, um, of course, and some people choose to die in their homes. When they know death is near, they often make the decision that they don't want to die in the hospital, they want to die in their own home, so to speak. All right. Uh, getting a little emotional here, right? I will try to get through this, right? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a touchy subject. And yes, I've ha had people die, okay, in my family. All right, let's keep going. The causes of death have also changed, okay? Uh, people used to die, you know, um, from, uh, you know, uh, different things in the past. Uh, because people live longer nowadays, um, they die of different diseases, of different things that have more to do with old age, okay, uh, rather than things having to do with wars and accidents and things like that. People used to die a lot longer, a lot sooner in the past because of wars and accidents and, you know, things like that. Um, People last longer nowadays, so they're more likely to get those diseases of old age, which we talked about before, okay? And after death, it's unclear, right? What happens after death? That may depend on your religious beliefs, okay? Uh, as to what you believe comes after that, but it's not really clear. Uh, as far as we know, no one has really come back and told us what happens afterward, but a lot of people have beliefs about it. And that's more of a cultural thing, a religious thing. Let's keep going. More about, uh, let's talk about culture, epochs, and death, okay? Uh, all known ancient societies uh, shared three common themes when it comes to what they believed about death, okay? Um, all ancient societies believe that uh, your actions during your life affect what happens to you after death. You know, that there's that saying that if you're a good person, you're going to go on to heaven. If you've been a bad person, then you're going to hell. That's one example, right? A lot of cultures believe in things like that, okay? Uh, the afterlife was assumed. Most people believe that there was an afterlife or that there is an afterlife, okay? And, um, you know, that the, you, things don't just come to an end. Mourners uh, said particular prayers and made specific offerings. So you pray over the dead, you know, you make uh, offerings. And in the past, it was in part to prevent the spirit of the dead from haunting them and hurting them, right? That if you didn't pay your respects, right, you didn't pray and offer them something, they might come back to haunt you, okay? Something scary, right? But not everybody, everybody believes that nowadays. These are what ancient societies believed. Of course, we're now living in a modern society, and we'll talk about what things are like now. Uh, religions, right? Uh, contemporary religion, so... Um, so religions today, basically, so each faith has distinct rituals and practices surrounding death. Different religions have, you know, slightly different religious practices. 
It's very common in many religions, for instance, that when somebody dies and you go to their funeral, you're supposed to wear black, for instance. That's a common thing. Um, but uh, other things can, uh, you know, uh, can vary as far as, you know, what, uh, what you do, you know, here in the, and this actually varies by nation as well. Um, here in the U.S., what usually happens is, of course, you know, you have a funeral and a lot of people show up to pay their respects. People dress in black and, you know, there's kind of a ritual. It's almost like going to church and the person gets buried afterward. Um, and, uh, you know, that whole... Uh, Funeral thing is actually very expensive. Uh, what the, the things that you go through, right? To have that whole thing done, it's actually expensive. It's expensive even if, by the way, even if the person gets cremated afterward, okay? Uh, being buried is even more expensive. But it turns out that's a very, very American thing, by the way, to have this fancy funeral, this very expensive funeral. That is not what happens in a lot of countries. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't even that way in the past here in the US. This is something of a modern thing that has to do with uh, basically business practices, that a business was created to deal with these sort of things. And of course, they want to make it profitable. So that's kind of what, why we have you know, these practices today. But in other countries, uh, death is not so much of a business. Okay? It's something that happens. People mourn, people get their loved ones buried or cremated or whatever it is. And it doesn't turn into this big, elaborate, expensive, things that pe expensive thing that people profit from. That's more of an American thing, by the way. But it is also happening in other parts of the country. As these values spread to other parts of the countries, they're also creating businesses that have to do with death over there. Um, I just think it's sad that people would profit from death and things like that. I don't think there should be a business of death. Okay, there should be services, yeah, that you pay some minor fees for, but not this big elaborate thing, you know, that costs as much as a wedding or something like that. But that's what we have here. Okay, uh, death customs uh, sustain communities and, and families, right? Um, these customs, right, traditions that people have help keep people together and help keep families together. You know, when people die, often people get together and some, you know, for the funeral. And, um, you know, sometimes you see people you haven't seen in a while. You know, people get connected, so to speak, and they see each other again. And sometimes it helps keep the family more united, stronger, so to speak, when this happens, even though it's sad. Religious practices change with historical conditions. Of course, you know, yes, the religious practices have changed as, you know, as history has changed, as the country has changed and developed, right? I told you guys how death has changed, right? It wasn't always something that had to do with business and money and things like that. It used to be different in the past, simpler more religious, now it's more of a business, the whole thing that happens, okay? Death always inspires strong emotions, you know? It's, it's what happens. And, you know, I get a little emotional just thinking about the whole thing, but yes, I have lost family members and stuff like that. It inspires strong emotions. And, um, you know, I don't have to tell you what those are, I guess. Let's keep going, right? When I get too bogged down in my emotions and then not be able to get through this. Uh, all right, this is difficult to talk about death and childhood. Okay, so we're going to talk about how uh, death is understood at different points in the lifetime. And it is difficult for children to understand death. Often they don't understand it, what happens, you know, like when they lose a pet or something like that, you know, they might see you bury the pet or something like that, the cat or, or the dog or whatever it is, or their hamster, you know, and they don't really know what is really happening. You know, they know the animal doesn't move anymore and they're in the ground, but they don't understand how profound that is, okay? They think it's something that's kind of temporary or something that's just not permanent and you can dig them up afterward or he's going to wake up afterward. They don't really understand that. So children's and children's perspectives of death when it comes to loved ones, adults and stuff like that, or their family, people they know, not animals anymore, but people, uh, is punctuated by Im impulsivity. They don't really understand. Children are not very logical. Uh, so they're more emotional, very impulsive as to how they feel, you know, the hurt and the pain. Uh, all right, let me just try to read this. Fairly ill children typically fear abandonment. All right, so frequent and... It's just difficult, right? Frequent and caring contact is more important than logic. Uh, it's important that you make children feel well, right? Um, you know, it's hard for them. 
all right, we'll try to get through this, especially when they're the ones who are gonna die. All right, I said it, all right, let's move on. <sighs> Older children oh, can be a little bit more logical. They seek facts, they're less anxious about dying or about, you know, when someone dies in general, they can understand it a bit more logically. All right, let's keep going. That was difficult, okay. What about an adolescence? How do teens understand death? Okay, uh, there is a tendency, as I've said before, for teenagers to have very little fear of death. They live their lives as if death doesn't really matter, teenagers, right? And you know that because they take a lot of risks. Teenagers engage in very risky behavior. You know, uh, the drug use, the uh, delinquency, right? Not all of them are that bad, of course, but they take risks, they, they engage in risky behavior. You know, if they, like for instance, if they have a car, they often drive too fast uh, or get very distracted or they wanna party a lot, party with strangers. And, you know, in, in general, it's very, very risky behavior that they engage in. Uh, or you know the kind of fun they want to have. So teenagers, to some extent, are not that afraid of death. They're kind of in denial about it. And this, the thrill seeking, right? The, taking all this, doing all this risky behavior, may be a way for them to control anxiety, a way to make themselves feel better. Because when you think about death, it makes you feel awful. Okay, it it just it does. I mean, I don't feel very good right now just lecturing about it, but. And teenagers usually don't want to think about that. Their own death, that they're going to die someday, forget about it. They don't want to think about that. So they live their lives as if they're immortal, as if they cannot be harmed. They take a lot of risk and they're in denial about death. But this helps us helps them feel better, right? To be in denial about it, uh, you know, to engage in this risky behavior as if it, you know, to, to live your life as if it doesn't matter, it doesn't exist. Terror management theory is the idea, this is a theory, it's the idea that people adopt cultural values and moral principles in order to cope with their fear of death. Terror management theory uh, basically says that uh, when you think about, to explain a different way, that when you think about death and you think not just about that, the fact that you're going to die, but you think about the fact you know, that you're going to die and you're going to be buried and the maggots are going to eat your body and you're going to degrade and, you know, think about your physical death, right? When you think about that, you think about that very strongly. What happens to people is, according to terror management theory, is they become um, very protective of their culture and their values. And it actually makes them more prejudiced, more, less tolerant of outsiders. It's a way for them to manage their terror by becoming more protective of themselves and the things that they, they believe in and the things and the groups that which they belong. And yes, you know, exper plenty of experiments have showed that when people think about their own death, and they've done this in the laboratory, they have people think about their own death very strongly and, and they follow very, uh, very clear, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, scenario there where they ask to think about this, this, and this. It turns out that, uh, you know, yeah, when people think about their own death, uh, it, it makes them kind of intolerant and prejudiced and, uh, you know, they get very protective of themselves and their groups. So terror management theory is basically the idea that people adopt cultural values and moral principles in order to cope with their fear of death. How do we cope with fear of death? According to terror management theory, it's by hanging on to our culture, hanging on to our values, right, to what we believe in. It actually makes us just less accepting of others. When we think about our own death, not death in general, but our own death. Um, what about death in adulthood? How do adults understand death or what's, what's that like for adults? Um, for adults, it, uh, it's different than, uh, you know, for teenagers. Uh, attitudes shift when adults become responsible for work and family. So as we get older, uh, you know, we raise families, we work in order to raise those families, and we become more responsible, okay? Uh, many adults quit taking drugs, right, uh, or addictive drugs. They start wearing seat belts, adopt other precautions. They, you know, they're more careful about how they go about their lives. They don't behave anymore like teenagers, okay? Um, now, in general, right, if we're talking about early adulthood, death anxiety increases from one teens to one from teens to 20s, 
Okay, so during the teens, there's not too much death anxiety, kind of in denial about that, but it increases after that to, you know, into one, once 20, so to speak. As we get older, you know, we start being more aware of it. We think more about it, right? But then it kind of goes down, right? Death anxiety decreases. And the reason it probably goes down is because you're just busy, busy raising a family, busy working, and you're just busy. You don't have time to worry about death and think about what's going to happen when you die. Uh, you just, you're busy. You have things to do. From ages 25 to 65, what about after that, right? This is early adulthood. From ages 25 to 65, adults who are terminally ill worry about leaving something undone or leaving family members, especially children. Those that are from 20 to 65, right? Uh, if they are terminally ill, if they do know they're going to die, that's what they worry about. I haven't finished this. I haven't done this, right? And I don't want to leave people behind, my kids and all that stuff. That's what people worry about. That's the age I'm in. That's in that bulk of <laughs> those 40 years, right? That's what I worry about, right? I don't want to go. I don't want to die. It's because I have, you know, children. And I want them. I want to raise them. I want to be in their lives. And, you know, I want to help them. Let's keep going. What about death in late adulthood? 65 and onward. Uh, believe it or not, in late adulthood, death anxiety decreases. You would think that people who are older would worry a lot more about dying, but they actually worry less about it. Death anxiety actually decreases. Probably because they're older and they've raised families, you know, and their kids are older and have their own lives, their own families, and they probably feel that, you know, they've done their part, so, so to speak. And if they die, it's not as bad as when they were younger, right? So they're not so anxious about death. Um, and hope rises. They're more hopeful, right? Um, you know, uh, that, um, you know, that it's, it might be the beginning of something new, especially if you believe in an afterlife or things like that, um, you know. Um, they're actually not that anxious about it. Uh, one sign of mental health among older adults is acceptance of their own mortality and altruistic concern about those who will, who will live on after them. So how do you know if you're actually mentally healthy as an adult? One sign that you're you're thinking of, that you are mentally healthy as, as an older adult um, is that you accept the fact that you're going to die, okay? And you're aware of it, you accept it, and you don't really worry so much about your, the fact that you're going to die, but, you know, you just want to help, you know, those who are, who are going to stay behind, so to speak, those who are going to live on. You're altruistic. You want to help them. That's a sign of a good mental health, right? You know you're going to die. And you want to do your part to help those that remain. All right. Uh, many older adults accept death and they plan. They have plans. Maybe plans about where they want to be buried, what they want, or maybe if they, where they want their ashes spread, that kind of stuff. They have plans. You know, also plans, financial plans, right? Who the money is going to go to, who the property is going to go to, all that stuff, right? Um, and families become more important when death seems near. It's kind of hard to talk about this stuff, right? All right, let's keep going. I have to lecture, I have to record, right? Um, I haven't done this before, so I'm not that used to it. I didn't record this lecture last semester. But um, yeah, it's important, right? To be with family when you're gonna die. That's what people wanna do. They wanna see their loved ones. Uh, it's hard, because, all right, let's just move on. All right, let's keep going. So I don't get too emotional. Yes, I've dealt with that several times. I've lost family members. Oh. Okay, uh, acceptance of death does not mean the elderly give up on living. Okay, let's talk about something less emotional. Okay, near-death experiences, right? Um, near-death experiences. Not everybody has had a near-death experience, but a near-death experience is an episode in which a person comes close to dying, but survives and then reports having left his or her own body, right? They report this out-of-body experience, this experience of kind of, okay, you know, uh, let me just read it. Moving toward a bright light, feeling peace and joy, okay? I haven't had one, but it just sounds very emotional. A near-death ex experience often includes religious elements. Yes, if you are religious and you believe certain things, you're more likely to experience things that have something to do with that. Okay, 
Those who have a near, near death experience often reach a worldview or you know, a way of looking at the world in which you know, there's a limitation of social status. They realize that you know, uh, being a big shot, your status, all that stuff, it doesn't really matter. You're just like everybody else and someday you're gonna die. You know, the social status thing doesn't matter very much. Ign insignificance of material possessions, property, money, things don't matter very much. You know, um, after you've had a near-death experience, you realize that that's not important. It really isn't important, right? Uh, you know, I get emotional about this. Uh, narrowness of self-centered. You're not a self-centered, you know, after a near-death experience. I haven't really had one, not, not like that. I, I almost drowned once, but I, I didn't come close to dying, okay? But yeah, I almost drowned one time, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't lose consciousness or anything like that. So I didn't have this experience. But uh, yes, when you're going to die or, you know, or you feel like you're going to die. I mean, I haven't gotten close to that, you know, but I know people who have. And it's not money and things that you worry about. It's not what matters. All right, let's get through this. Let's get through it. All right. It's hard to talk about this stuff. Ah, what matters is family, okay? Okay, now what's a good death? What's a bad death? Let's talk about this. All right, I'm gonna try to get to compose myself again, right? I gotta keep it together or this is gonna take way too long. I'm not gonna get through it. All right, um, what's a good death? What's a bad death when it comes to dying? A good death is a peaceful, quick and painless death. We all know that, okay? That's what a good death is. That's what we all want, right? We want it to be peaceful, we want it to be quick and we want it to be painless, right? And after we've had a long life, right? When it's our time, we want it to be done quickly, right? We don't want to linger, okay? That's a bad death if you linger. Um, and you want to be in the comp company of family and friends. All right, familiar surroundings, okay? That kind of stuff. Uh, people in all religious and cultural contexts hope for a good death. We all want a good death, right? A bad death is when you linger and basically, uh, and you're basically, well, you linger and you're very sick and stuff like that. A bad death lacks the six characteristics of a good death and is dreaded particularly by the elderly. A bad death is not like a good death, right? It's a death that lingers where you're sick and ill for a long time, family's not there, die alone, that kind of stuff. That's a bad death, okay? It doesn't have what a good death has. Um, you know, well, it, it, it's, it's just different. It's the opposite of a good death, okay? Uh, attending to the needs of the die. all right. Um, Kubler-Ross identify emotions experienced by dying people, which she divided into five stages. Uh, you know, um, when you deal with death, you go through these five stages. You know, first there's denial, right? Denial that, you know, that the person is, well, it could be about your death or maybe about somebody else's death, but there's five stages you go through right? Um, let's say that you're the one who's terminally ill and is going to die, right? First, there's denial, right? That you're not going to die, right? That kind of stuff, that you're going to get through this, you're going to recover, right? Uh, that kind of stuff, you're going to get better, you know, your um, whatever, the cancer or whatever you have, you're going to beat it and you're going to be fine. That's the first stage, denial. Or if there's somebody in your family who's dying or somebody you love who's dying, right? There's the denial at first. He'll get better, he'll recover or she'll recover, you know, they've been through similar stuff before. They've gotten sick and they've recovered. They're going to get better, right? They're not going to die or I'm not going to die. That's the denial part. That's the first stage. And then comes anger. Uh, you know, it, you're upset. You know, you're angry about it. And then bargaining, right? There comes the bargaining, you know, in which you, you know, it's like you try to make uh, deals with God. You know, God, please let me live and I'll do this. Uh, but, you know, that kind of stuff, right? I'll be a good person. I'll donate to charity, right? Let me not die. Let me survive this or let me keep going, right? That's the bargaining part. It usually has a religious thing to it. If you believe in God and that kind of stuff, you bargain with God, right? There is no bargaining with God, okay? By the way, when it's, it's just whatever is going to happen, is going to happen. When it's your time, it's your time, okay? But people try to do that. And then depression, then you're all depressed about it. You know that you're going to die. 
and you feel awful and miserable, or maybe a loved one's gonna die and you feel awful and miserable about that. And then eventually acceptance. You feel better, you accept it. And you're able to cope. And eventually it happens, you know, and that's it. And of course, you know, of course you can go through the stages even after somebody has died. I should point that out, right? It's difficult. Let's keep going. And that's why we often don't talk about this stuff, by the way. We almost never want to talk about death. It's just difficult, okay? It's very, very difficult. People don't want to talk about it, right? But it's going to happen to all of us. And it's hard to think about that. Um, let's talk about the hospice, right? Hospice care. Here's the thing. Um, when people are close to dying, people are going to die. Um, they usually don't die in their homes anymore. They go into what's called hospice care, right? Um, my wife's uh, mother, mother-in-law, basically passed away some years ago, and you know she went through that. Hospice, a hospice is, is an institution or a program in which the terminally ill patient received palliative care. A hospice is a place where you go, right, where they're gonna kind of look after you before you die, and they're not really there to treat you, right, to cure you. They're just there to make you feel better before you die. So they might provide things like medication, make sure you're comfortable, right? Um, they're not going to do things to delay your death, okay? It's just, it's, it's just hospice care. It's the kind of care you get before you die. It's just to make you feel better, right? If you're in pain, you might be on medication. You know, they take care of you. They, you know, they comfort you. Family members come visit, you know. It's where you usually go right before you die. And their job is really not to make you live longer. That's not what they do. It's just, it's hospice care, right? Uh, there are, yes, um, you know, people who are, you know, whose job that is. And, that, and that's their job, okay? That's what they do. And don't be surprised if they're not that sensitive about it, okay? Because it's their job. To you as the one who is, you know, who's, who your, whose loved one is dying, it's a big deal to them. It's their job. And um, it doesn't mean they won't do a good job, right, of helping your loved ones, but it's just a job to them, okay? And sometimes they don't do a good job. You know, it, it, I, believe it or not, a lot of it has to do with money. If you have a lot of money and you can afford really good care, good hospice care, you'll be treated a lot better than if you're poor. That's the reality, okay? I've seen it happen. Uh, two principles of hospice care, all right? Two, two important things, right? Each patient's autonomy and decisions are respected, right? The per so what the person wants to do, their wishes are respected, okay? Who they wanna see, who they don't wanna see, you know, if they wanna eat, if they don't wanna eat, if they wanna take medication or they refuse it, right? Their decisions are respected, okay? Or if they wanna die in their own home, they want to be out of there. They want to die in their own homes. They know the time is near. But this is usually where you go before you die. Okay. Um, another principle, another rule about hospice care is family members and friends are counseled before the death, right? They let you know what to expect, what's, you know, what's going to happen. Um, they show you how to care, you know, for, you know, your dying relatives, right? Relative. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and they provide some uh, help after, after death, you know. Um, as far as uh, advice and, you know, uh, what to do and things like that. I don't recall too much of that to tell you the truth about help after death, but, you know, they might connect you with services, you know, or, you know, that this is the next step, funeral services or this kind of stuff or whatever it is, things like that. It's a sad thing, but it happens. Not with the family, okay? So where death occurs in the United States. So look at the, the pie chart there. Where does death occur in the United States? So 29%, um, they die in the hospital, okay? Um, that's, uh, uh, you know, hospice care, you know? Um, the home, uh, it's about 27% of people die in their homes, about 21% die in a nursing home and 23% other. Uh, other could be a variety of things. You know, maybe you die at work, or in a car accident or something like that, or somewhere else, you know, um, other than the hospital and 
a home and a nursing home. So that's you know where people die by percentage. So almost everyone prefers to die at home. Most people want to die, you know, in familiar surroundings with their you know next to their loved ones. Yet, yet most people die in an institution. Okay, if you take the hospital and nursing home right together, that's over fifty percent. You know, that's about fifty percent actually. Um, so, um, you know, and of course, oh, and if you also uh, uh, include, of course, not dying at home, the somewhere else, then of course, that's not in your home. So most people, so most people want to die in their homes, but most people don't get to have that happen. Okay. Um, so the way pe most people die is surrounded usually by medical personnel, right, and high tech equipment, not by the, you know, not by the voices of, and touch of their loved ones. That's not the way most people, that's the way most people want to die in their homes and things like that, but usually you die in a hospital, in a nursing home, or in a place like that, and there's medical people around you, and, and then you die. No one knows exactly when you're gonna die, what minute, and chances are, you know, it's medical people who are gonna be around you. And that's, that's the reality. You know, hopefully your loved ones are there, but sometimes, you know, you die, when they're not there, even if they have been visiting you, sometimes, you know, you pass, you know, when they're not there. Um, the, other, the other category is even worse as it includes most lethal accidents and homicides, right? Homicides, accidents, things like that. Um, that's what the other category is, as, as I've explained. Let's keep going. Barriers to entering hospice care. Okay, so hospice care. Um, well, here's the thing, hospice patients must be terminally ill, okay? They don't just accept anybody into hospice care, okay? The person must be terminally ill, right? Dying, basically. They don't want you to linger in hospice care for years, okay? They just want you there for a short time. Death anticipated within six months, okay? They don't really want to care for someone who's sick and who's gonna linger, it's just like this person is dying and doesn't have a lot of time left, and then you can put them in hospice care. The patients and givers must accept death, right? You know, family members, loved ones have to accept that, yes, this person is about to die. Uh, and, you know, you accept that. Hospice care is costly, very expensive. And uh, of course, uh, like I said, it depends on how much money you have, the quality that you can afford and insurance and things like that. Actually, I'm not even sure what they, whether insurance covers hospice care or not. Um, it might. Uh, availability varies whether it's available to you or not whether there's room. Can you explain how these, how these things are barriers, right? How these things keep people from getting into hospice cares? Yes, the expense, right? Whether it's available, right? People have an accepted death or the person isn't yet dying, right? But just sick, then you can't get into hospice care. Let's keep going. Ethical issues, deciding when uh, death occurs. There are a, a wide array of treatments and interventions uh, that can be used to postpone and prevent death. Yes, you can, people can linger nowadays because of medicine, right? They can put you on life support. There's treatments, all kinds of stuff that, you know, might give you some additional time, some months more or years or whatever it is, right? So that stuff does exist. Uh, many life support measures and medical interventions circumvent the diseases and organ failures that once caused death, right? Yes, those life support systems can, keep you living despite the fact maybe that you have a bad heart or maybe your lungs aren't working properly or this or that, right? They help keep you going even when your organs may be failing, okay? Religious advisors, doctors, lawyers, and family members disagree with, often disagree with one another about what to do, you know? Should we continue, uh, you know, uh, having our loved one continue to get treatment and putting off and, and you know, well, putting off the inevitable, or should we just pull the plug, so to speak, and let this person go sooner, right, than later, right? There's disagreements about that stuff. Some people uh, want to keep the family member alive as long as possible. Some people say it's, you know, it's just, you know, that they should be allowed to just go, and uh, and you just have to deal with it, right? I know that sounds mean, but it's not often not mean. It's just that sometimes, you know there's a lot of suffering and a lot of things to deal with. And sometimes people just, you know, want it to be over with, right? Rather than having this, you know, 
death, disease thing, you know, the suffering kind of uh, continuing. The person might be uh, suffering a lot, by the way. You know, do you want it to continue suffering or do you want it to just end it, right? So people disagree about these things. And yes, money has something to do with that as well, okay? Some people, it's in their best interest to keep the person going. For other people, it's in their best interest for the person to die. But I'm not saying everyone's looking at it, looking at it in that point of view. Most people are not. But there are disagreements about what to do when somebody is dying, right? Whether to pull the plug, so to speak, or to keep treating them and keep them lingering for months or years afterward, you know, trying to prevent uh, you know, the inevitable. Ethical issues, more about ethical issues, historic evidence of death. Uh, okay, so we're um, so what, you know, what, what, what do you need in order to know that the person is dead, basically? In the past, historic evidence of death in the past, the way they decided somebody was dead, basically, is when the person didn't have a heartbeat, wasn't breathing. In the past, they took that as, okay, this person has now died, passed on. Nowadays, it's different, okay? Nowadays, more is required to basically someone to qualify as being dead, so to speak, or having gone through death or passed on. It's possible that someone may not have a heartbeat, might not be breathing, could still be alive. People have been known to, you know, to like come back, so to speak, you know, where they stop breathing suddenly or their heart starts. Some people have been buried alive. No heartbeat, not breathing, right? Uh, that's not enough, you know, to ensure that somebody's dying, okay? Nowadays, uh, that somebody's dead, actually. They might still be alive or might, you know, there has to be other other things. So the modern evidence of death, right? The way to nowadays to legally determine if somebody is dead is, well, they have to be brain dead, so to speak, right? There's no mental activity. Check their brain waves, right? Uh, there's nothing there. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no brain activity. Locked in syndrome, uh, they're not responsive, okay, to anything. They don't move, they don't talk, they're, I mean, there's, there's nothing, no response whatsoever. Or maybe they're in a coma. In a co when you're in a coma, um, of course, you're technically still alive, okay? Um, but sometimes, you know, well, people decide to pull the plug, so to speak, and just let the person go. Or they're in a vegetative state. Um, you know, they're not responsive. Um, you know, similar to being in a coma, but... Um, all that can be taken as evidence that the person is basically, you know, dead, brain dead, or maybe not coming back or, or whatever it is. Nowadays, uh, to just specifically to know someone is technically dead, it has more to do with the brain, okay? If the brain is not responding, as would be the case if, there, if there's brain death, right? Uh, they're in a coma, vegetative state, lock, that kind of stuff, right? I mean, the brain, they're not responding, okay? The brain is not active. Okay, that's more taken uh, nowadays more as evidence of a person uh, actually being dead than in the past. Um, no professional or international agreement. Yes, there are disagreements about uh, among professionals of what does it mean for someone to really be dead or in other countries, they have different definitions. There's disagreements about that stuff where the person is really alive, right? They're in a coma, right? They're still alive. Does it mean they're dead? Not necessarily, they're in a vegetative state, they're not, uh, they're not really dead, but it's not much better, okay? Um, and there are disagreements about whether, you know, you should pull the plug or not, or whether the person is, can really be legally classified as dead or not. And people argue about that stuff for many reasons. It's a property, because of money, because of care, all kinds of things. Um, there's also um, euthanasia. euthanasia. Euthanasia sounds really bad, okay? Um, it's, it's basically when somebody decides that it's time for this person to go and they do something so that the person dies, okay? There's different, uh, you know, different forms of euthanasia. There, there is passive euthanasia, a situation in which a seriously ill person is allowed to die naturally, right? Through the cessation of medical intervention, right? That's one way, right? Just they refuse all medications, they refuse to eat, they refuse everything, and they just basically die after that, okay? And it's often not, it's not only the case that they refuse, sometimes the, you know, the person is not capable uh, basically of uh, consenting to anything. Um, 
but the family decides, you know, but someone's in a coma vegetative state that, uh, you know, you're just gonna remove all medication, all care, and just let the person go, let the person die. That's passive euthanasia. Um, a, a DNR or do not resuscitate order is a written order from a physician, from a physician, right? A doctor, sometimes initiated by a patient, patient's advanced directive. Sometimes patients, while they're still alive and, 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 and mentally aware and everything, mentally competent, make these decisions that when they get to that point, right? When they're sick and uh, terminally ill, uh, they do not want any care, right? That they just want people to just let them go, let them die, right? Or it could be uh, by a proxy's request, or maybe they basically uh, sign off before uh, to give somebody else the right to basically to not to resuscitate, right? To not to try to keep them alive, or if they die, not to try to bring them back, right? To, you know, basically uh, do CPR or try to get their heart going again or that kind of stuff, right? Um, no, uh, no attempt should be made to revive a patient during cardiac or respiratory arrest, right? No attempt should be made to revive the person if something happens to them. Some people have those kind of orders or they've given orders to other people um, so that the doctor or whoever is caring for them uh, knows that they should just let them go and let them die. Uh, you know, my wife's um, uh, uh, mother had orders like that. She was... She wasn't that old. She, I think she was like, you know, 75 or something like that. But she was a lifelong smoker. And um, and she had those kind of orders that when she got sick that she didn't want, you know, to linger, so to speak. It just, you know, just let her go, so to speak. Uh, they refuse care. And by the way, the re refusal of care, medicine and things like that uh, is not, uh, it, it doesn't um, always, I mean, the thing about meals and things like that, that's a separate thing, by the way. They can still eat and do all that stuff, right? But they just have orders that if I get sick or if I have a heart attack, don't try to bring me back, that kind of thing. The, the thing about the other kind of care, that's that's separate. But sometimes people make those decisions that they don't want to eat anymore, they don't want to take medicine anymore, and they just want to get weaker and die, right? Sometimes people make those decisions as well. But that's usually a separate thing. Usually with we're talking about that the person is not to receive any kind of treatment anymore that would keep them alive. There's also active use, euthanasia. And this is the part that's very, uh, the kind of euthanasia that's very controversial. Active use, euthanasia um, is, a, is a situation in which someone takes action to bring about the other person's death, right? With the intention of ending that person's suffering. Like, uh, you know, they get an injection basically. Uh, the person has the, who's suffering has decided that they're suffering too much and they know they're going to die and they don't want to linger and they want the doctor to give them some lethal injection, basically. And it's usually, they get, you know, some injection where they um, basically can, um, it calms them down and they fall asleep and, you know, and they die that way. So it's peaceful, so to speak. Um, some people make those decisions or want those kind of things to happen to them, right? They want somebody to euthanize them and just put them out of their misery, so to speak. They don't want to linger. It's not legal in a lot of countries, but it is legal in some circ under some circumstances, not under all circumstances. You can't just, you know, euthanize somebody because they're depressed and they don't want to live, right? And say, hey, doctor, you know, give me a lethal injection. I want to die. That's not going to happen anyway, okay? Okay. Um, but it's legal under some, some circumstances where the person is terminally ill, really suffering, things like that. You know, they're going to die in some places like in the Netherlands and Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, still illegal in most other countries, but rarely prosecuted. If it does happen in other countries uh, where there's active euthanasia, euthanasia uh, usually they don't do something about it, criminally charge the person, right? Um, but um, it's not technically not legal in, uh, in most places. Here in the US, it's actually illegal as far as I know. And I know this because there was a doctor in the past and I haven't ke kept up with that kind of uh, legal stuff or you know, that type of medicine, but, um, or that type of uh, uh, whatever, that, that, that medical component of, uh, of things. Um, but I do know that in the past, there was somebody by the name of Dr. Kavorkian who was basically euthanizing patients 
you know, that he was, you know, there were people under his care who uh, they wanted to die. They didn't want to linger. And he basically, you know, agreed with them and thought it was okay. And yes, he was euthanizing people. You know, he wasn't murdering them or things like that, right? People wanted this to happen and he made it happen for them. And then of course they arrested him. There was this big trial and I'm pretty sure he was convicted of basically killing all those people. But in reality, those people wanted to die and wanted to be euthanized. And he basically just went along with their wishes. But technically, as far as I know, at least back in the day, I, I spoke, it, it's against the law, okay? Active use, euthanasia, right? Where you do something so that the person dies, okay? So you, you actually do something to them, inject them, kill them in some way, right? That's different than passive euthanasia in which you just don't give them medication anymore, don't provide any treatment. You're still technically killing them, but it's in a passive way. But active euthanasia is illegal in most places. Um, act, more about active use, euthanasia. Some physicians uh, condone active use, euthanasia, euthanasia when three conditions occur. There are a lot of doctors, uh, physicians that agree that active use, euthanasia should be used, right? And under these three conditions, they say if the person is suffering, right? And they their suffering cannot be relieved, right? That they're just suffering tremendously and there's nothing that can make them feel better. They have an incurable illness, right? They, uh, you know, they're not gonna recover and they're just gonna die. Or if the patient wants to die and the end, not or, but and if the patient wants to die. These three things, right? And when these three conditions occur, they're suffering and you can't really do away with the suffering. Medicine isn't helping, they're not feeling better, right? They have an incurable illness, they're gonna die, and the person wants to die. A lot of people agree, doctors agree, that under those circumstances, that it should be allowed that a doctor, someone you know, uh, qualified, should euthanize them, you know, give them some kind of injection in which they, you know, they peacefully die. They do that, by the way, to criminals who are given the death sentence and things like that. And they do that also to animals, to dogs, and you know, and cats and things like that that uh, you know are in shelters and things like that. They euthanize them. Well, you know, it also exists for people as well, but for the most part, it's illegal in this country. Um, physician assisted suicide. Um, so this is a controversial form of active euthanasia in which a doctor provides the means for someone to end their own life, right? The doctor provides them with something, right? Maybe they hook them up to something, um, have something in their arm, a, a needle or something like that, that's hooked up to some machine and they have a little button or something that they can press if they want to end it, right? If they want to just, you know, uh, end their life, so to speak. That's, uh, that's one thing, right? Um, it could also be that the doctor actually injects them, okay? Whether the, you know, they provide the means for the person to do it themselves or the doctor does it themselves, that's physician-assisted suicide. There's an argument that, you know, that a given action will start a chain of events that will culminate in an undesirable outcome, okay? The argument that, you know, that if you provide them with the means that they're gonna do it, so to speak. And that's gonna to lead to an undesirable outcome. Maybe the person just doesn't feel well at that moment and is having some doubt and they decide to you know, end their lives, so to speak. And some people argue, well, if they didn't have the means to do it, they wouldn't have done that. They would have changed their mind, okay? There is concern, right? Hastening a death when, a term, uh, when terminally ill people request it, right? May cause a society to slide into killing sick people who are not ready to die, especially the old and the poor. If we allow this, people make these arguments. If we allow this, right? Um, is it possible that we're allowing something that's going to become something worse later on? That we're going to basically evolve into a society in which we just kill people who are sick and dying or who are old, right? Just to make room for the people that we have, you know, the younger people, so to speak. People are afraid that that might happen if, uh, if, if active youth, euthanasia is allowed, right, or physician-assisted euthanasia, that people will just start killing people. And sometimes, uh, you know, just because they wanna get rid of them. And it will be hard to prove that, uh, you know, that it wasn't, uh, you know, that it, was, that it was illegal or something like that. So it's illegal, okay, for the most part uh, in most countries. More about physician-assisted suicide. Um, 
Inter international physician assisted suicide. So the ne Netherlands has per permitted active euthanasia and physician assisted suicide since 1980. In the Netherlands, it's, it's legal, right? Since 1980. And, and, the, and in 2002, they voted on it again and they still said it's legal, okay? Uh, first, of course, they try to make uh, the suffering bearable. First, they try to make the person feel better, right? Um, but you know they've also been criticized for paying too little attention to the patient's psychological state. They've been criticized for that, that people are being euthanized, but they're not taking into account that the person may feel depressed or has dementia or something like that. And they don't really know what they're doing. They don't know what they're getting into. They're not mentally, psychologically healthy. So they shouldn't be allowed to make those decisions. There's been criticisms that physicians are not taking that into account, that people just wanna die and they say, okay, you know, we can make this happen without considering the psychological stuff. Because you might want to die just because you're psychologically unhealthy. When you're depressed, you know, you often feel like you want to die. That doesn't mean that you should or that somebody should help you die. You, U.S. physician-assisted suicide, uh, death with dignity, physician-assisted suicide in Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California. So they have passed this thing called death with, uh, with dignity uh, in, in these states. California, Vermont, Washington, Oregon, right? Uh, death uh, with dignity physician assisted suicide, right? So I guess it is legal in some states, but for the most part, it's uh, illegal. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Uh, Oregon's residents reasons for requesting physician assisted suicide. So in Oregon, what are the, why are the, what are the reasons that people want to basically be euthanized, wanna end it all, so to speak? Um, you know, uh, it says percent of patients, right? Uh, making these reasons. 96% of them say that they don't enjoy living anymore. Okay, it's not worth it, right? Loss of autonomy, right? 92% says, well, they can't do anything anymore. You know, they can't really take care of themselves. They can't really do anything. Loss of dignity, they feel, you know, like they don't, well, they don't have the dignity, right? They can't walk, they can't take care of themselves. They're just a burden. A lot of them feel like they're just, it's just not a dignified thing to just linger and suffer. Burden on others. They don't want to be a burden on other people, right? About close to 50% say that, right? Loss of control over their body. About more than a third of them say it's because of that, okay? Uh, say that as well. Um, about 30% of them say, uh, you know, 29% say it's because of the pain. Um, and the two there, final implications of treatment, right? Uh, I'm not sure what that refers to, to tell you the truth. Final... Uh, of course, it has to do with death, but uh, that's, that's, those, are the, those are the reasons uh, in a study done, uh, published in 2016, uh, those are the things people mention as to why they want physician-assisted suicide, why they want those things. Um, affirmation of life. Okay, so normal grief. So after somebody dies, uh, what happens? Okay, so there is uh, bereavement, the sense of loss following a death, right? You feel that you, you've lost someone, right? Uh, there's, you know, there, there's a loss, right? An emptiness, an empty feeling. It, it feels really awful, okay? That's bereavement, the, the, the sense of loss, right? That you've lost something, that someone isn't there, right? Uh, there's the grief also. Uh, it's just difficult to talk about stuff, but powerful sorrow that an individual feels at the death of another, right? You feel really awful. And I've been there, right? It's, it's awful. Okay, it's just really bad. That's the grief, right? Bereavement is the sense of loss, right? Person's not there anymore. Grief is the, the really painful feelings. And then mourning, right? Ceremonies and behaviors that a religion or a culture prescribes for people uh, to employ in expressing bereavement after death. The things that people do after somebody dies, right? Most people have a funeral in this country. In other cultures, they do other things. Other countries, they do other things. Believe it or not, there are some countries, I can't name one specifically, because I haven't read about this recently, but there are some countries in which uh, people have a celebration after somebody dies, that it's not a bad thing, that it's a good thing, that they're moving on to a better life, you know, to heaven or the afterlife, which, in which there's no suffering and things like that, right? But it varies, right? Here in the US, we see it as a very negative thing and we go through this whole ritual. In other countries, sometimes it's, it's different, right? It's a celebration, something like that. There are some, um, it's just other places where people do other things that may seem bizarre. There's some places like in Mexico, for instance, that some of you may be aware of, where they don't really bury the dead people. They, it's like there's this place where like they put them on display there. Like, 
I don't know too much about it, but the corpse is there and people could come visit a person there, the, the, you know, the corpse, so to speak, as it decays and turns into a skeleton and they're right there, not buried. That seems a bit strange, right? I'm not really too familiar with that, but I know that uh, there are some places like that in Mexico. I haven't seen them, but I've seen documentaries. Uh, that's a very strange thing. Yes, uh, you know, usually you don't want to see a decaying, decomposing body, but there are some rituals that involve things like that where people aren't really buried. Um, okay, last thing over here, complicated grief. So there's different types of grief. There's absent grief, in a situation in, in, which an over, in which overly private people cut themselves off from the community and customs uh, that allow and expect grief, right? And can lead to social isolation. Sometimes people grieve in that way, right? They're very private people. They just don't wanna see anybody. They don't wanna go to work. They don't wanna see anybody, talk to anybody. That's what some people do. Um, I think that's probably what I would do to tell you the truth, right? That's kind of, you know, if someone very close to me dies, I usually don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to deal with anybody. All right, there's also a disenfranchised grief, a situation in which certain people, although they are bereaved, right, they've lost someone, are prevented from mourning publicly by cultural customs or social restrictions. Um, yes, sometimes people cannot publicly mourn, you know, their... Uh, deceased loved ones. For cultural reasons, in some cultures, uh, you're not allowed to get near a dead body or touch a dead body. Well, most people don't touch a dead body, but there's some cultures that have very uh, clear restrictions about that, that you are not to be around the dead and not to touch anything uh, that is touching the dead, not allowed to touch the coffin or anything like that. Um, there are restrictions like that um, uh, in some cultures, but, but just Think about this way too, what's happened in the US recently, right? With COVID, a lot of people died and because of COVID and the fear of the spread, a lot of people weren't allowed to mourn their loved ones. Um, I think they're allowing a little bit more now, um, but when when people were really scared and you know, and, this, and it was spreading very rapidly, uh, a lot of people weren't allowed to mourn, weren't allowed to go to the funeral, weren't allowed to be there. So that's really sad. Well, that didn't happen like to me, but you know, because I've had, a, you know, a couple of people died before COVID, right? But not during COVID, but I can imagine how sad that is. All right, let's keep going. Last thing here, incomplete grief, right? The situation in which circumstances interfere with the process of grieving. People are not allowed to grieve, right? Um, the circumstances do not allow it. Maybe you're just too busy working or doing this or that, and you're, you don't really have time to grieve, or you can't grieve, right? The grief process may be incomplete. If mourning is cut short, right, you have to go back to work or you have to do this or that, and you're just not allowed to feel sad that long, not allowed to pay your respects, right? Um, you know, or if other people are distracted from the role uh, in, in recovery, you know, they're just, uh, uh, they just are not allowed to grieve like they normally would, um, and that basically that's called incomplete grief. And therefore they don't really haven't gone through the process. So they haven't really recovered. And sometimes that happens, you know, cause you haven't, you know, you haven't gone through it. Maybe you weren't there at the funeral or whatever it is, or, you know, you couldn't go or you had to go back to work right away and you could only stay for a short time and you weren't really allowed to talk to loved ones afterward and go through the whole process that people go through. All right, guys, that's it. I'll stop uh, recording and stop sharing.